wonderful good morning Toronto. Welcome to Cybers. We are really excited to kick us off for an amazing week uh, with lots of uh, conversation, um, encounters, meeting old friends and news. So as we're at the first session, so let me just ask a question to everybody of you. So for whom is the first Cybers? Just raise your hand, please. So welcome, new friends. Uh, really glad to have you. And of course, to everybody else, welcome back. We're really excited um, on, on this session today. And also, welcome to my fellow panelists. So thanks for joining us. And also, welcome to the colleagues uh, joining us digitally across the globe. Um, we want to be really an interactive session today. So when you have downloaded the app, please open it. We're going to have some polls we want to share with you. We also want to enable you to ask questions um, so that we can face it into the discussion as we go. Uh, it is available through the app. Please choose uh, conference room number five, our session, so we're able to engage. And um, I really want to take the opportunity um, to introduce my fellow panelists um, to all of you because it's really exciting um, the people we've brought together today. So we have Andrew from BMI Mellon, we have Mark from NetWest, we have Samir from the Government of India, we have uh, Sarah from Lloyds, and we have Faisal from Buna. Um, so you can see it's not only banks that we're going to involve into our discussion, but really across the globe. Um, our topic today will be the question, uh, is the future of money digital and instant? Um, and I think we all agree to some extent, yes. Um, we have seen a lot of changes in the industry over the last decades. We're going to celebrate today a Swiss 50th anniversary and uh, we have seen a massive change in the payment industry over the years, just accelerated over the pandemic. And uh, we're seeing more initiatives in instant payment. What does it mean? Um, how can we enable really frictionless adoption, not only in one country, but also cross-border? And uh, also the rise of mobile payments. Uh, so just remember 20, 30 years ago, you went to your bank, you maybe used a check or just these little forms you signed and everything. And nowadays, we have it in our pocket. Everybody expects really payments to be instant, to be frictionless um, and available at all time. But that also imposes some of the challenges, not only for us as banks, but also for our industry partners across the globe. So today in our discussion, we're going to shed light on a lot of those questions. We're really excited to share that with you, and we're really looking forward to a great hour with you. So to kick us off, actually, we want to engage with you, and uh, we have brought up one slide of question. Um, on how many payments will be instant in five years? This is one of the questions I think lots of panels ask each time. The, the rates sometimes differ a little bit, so we're really excited to see how your tendency is going that morning. Ooh, this is a bold. Uh <laughs> Really impressive, so thanks. As the answers come in, uh, let's start with our uh, first uh, first question. So Sarah, uh, in the UK, faster payments has been around for some time, and in our pre-discussion, you also shed some light on what we can learn from that. So maybe you want to really share your journey, what happened, and what you see also as the next steps in adopting in some payments. Sure. So. At Lloyd's, uh, we touch one in three account to account payments in the UK. So we've got a really good proxy um, that and the fact that we've got you know 20 million customers through our digital banks, so we can really see how faster payments are being adopted and used. Um, what I would say is that on the retail side, instant payments are really quite ubiquitous now. You know, we've been on that journey since 2008 when faster payments were introduced and uh, with open banking introduced in 2018, that you know, era of a frictionless payment system with the customer at the heart of it is something that you know, our, our customers really have, have come to accept and take, take for granted within the UK. Um, what, what's interesting for me, and you can sort of see from the panel results as well, that 
you know, not all payments are going to be instant and digital. Um, so when you look at our corporate client base, um, so, so the, um, the limit for instant payments, obviously it's moved up to a million pounds fairly recently, but that's from a £10,000 initial start. So you see there is going to be some time where that adoption sort of works through and BACS in the UK is still the biggest mm -hmm. mechanism for the transfer of money in, in our corporate sphere. Um, so, so, you know, we, we can really see the way that instant payments have been adopted in the retail space uh, and it is starting to, to become more ubiquitous as we, you know, have bigger limits and um, better tailored client journeys in our corporate sphere. Yeah, excellent. I think really the adoption between corporates and retail is different. So, uh, Andrew, in our discussion, so, um, yeah, is really the requirement out there from corporates that every payment needs to be instant or what you see also in the corporate space and changes there? Yeah, so just a quick aside is that on Saturday before I left, I had to write out a physical check to my university for a donation, and it was painstaking to do so. And there was no QR code I could scan, there was no online website. I had to fill out the check, put it in an envelope, put a stamp, and send it in the mail. So it's very inefficient for me as a consumer and very inefficient for the university because they then have to pay additional fees when it comes to receiving and processing that check. And it's also delaying the time of which they can actually use those funds and put that to use within the university. So when we take a look within the US space, there is this growing demand from consumers that they do want digital. But from the uh, banks and the corporate's perspective is we've become so efficient with processing checks that there's very little that's pushing it. We within the US, we don't have the, I would say the benefit, if you will, in some cases, of a mandate or the requirement to use digital payments, or at least not yet, either by our central bank or by our government. And so with that, it's really driven by consumer demand. And while that's starting to increase, depending on the, the region, the locality, and also the generation is we're not yet seeing that impetus or that, that drive. But for these uh, corporates who are using digital payments for ACH and for real-time payments now since we launched in 2017, is that they are finally starting to realize, hey, this is nice if I can receive a transaction in nights, weekends, holidays, et cetera. But they're also challenged with staffing up for 24 7 365 is they say, well, that's a nice to have, but that's not a need to have, at least not yet. So there's still this shift that's happening within the marketplace where there is this growing demand, but there's not yet the uh, substantive supply to drive that forward. So uh, very encouraged by what we're seeing and also with the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve also brought to light their uh, real time payment system fed now just a couple of months ago. And we hope that with the combination of RTP through the clearinghouse and Fed now through the Federal Reserve within the US, that we'll start to see more of that drive. And then lastly, also for international remittances, and this is where working with organizations such as Buna and others internationally is coming up to speed on those digital payments and it's only gonna help further accelerate that momentum going forward. Yeah, and I think really one of the trends is not only to look into national schemes on instant payment, but really looking into the collaboration. And this is also one of the themes we will be discussing a lot around cyber, so collaborative finance in a fragmented world. So uh, Faisal, at VUNA, this is the heart of your operations. So you might want to share some of your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. So uh, maybe just a few words about VUNA uh, as a, a background. Um, it's a cross-border payment system uh, introduced by the Arab Central Banks, uh, owned by the uh, Arab Monetary Fund. Um, it's a market infrastructure, basically, for uh, real-time cross-border payments. Uh, it today, it has uh, six uh, settlement currencies, so the US dollar, the euro, the UAE dirham, the Saudi rial, the Egyptian pound, and the Jordanian dinar. And there are more than 100 banks from 13 countries onboarded are using it, and. Uh, more banks are onboarding, not only from the Arab uh, region where this idea was born, but also now we see interest from, from the rest of, uh, uh, rest of the world. Um, on the, on, on the real-time uh, payments for cross-border, the expectation is coming or driven by the uh, end users. Uh, end users now, they see domestic payments uh, going real-time. So the natural next step for them is to, to see cross-border as well going real time. Uh, all, all the frictions that uh, uh, domestic payment schemes in, in several countries managed to, to resolve, 
And now they are looking at seeing the same progress in, in cross-border payments. And in Buna, this is the heart of what we do, to uh, make uh, cross-border payments as efficient as uh, domestic payments. Obviously, we do not serve uh, end clients directly. Our clients are the banks, the, 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 the commercial banks. And uh, the, the, the core is to enable them to go through this journey that uh, uh, Andrew explained, uh, enable them to, to provide the, uh, the seamless experience at cross-border level in multiple currencies, um, 24 by 7, uh, and so on and so forth. Excellent. So, yeah, as we've just discussed, I think part of the adoption really comes from acceptance uh, from the users. So, Samir, uh, in India, you have seen a impressive transformation in the way you're paying, supported by the government. So what were the key drivers for you really to move these initiatives forward? Uh, yeah, so see, there are certain things which needs to be in place in order for you to ensure that the payments are digital and instantaneous. Now, just to make a small distinction out here, you can have a digital payment which is non-instantaneous and you can also have an non-digital payment which is instantaneous. So in the four quadrants, what we are looking at is a digital payment which is instantaneous. Now you should have some kind of enabling environment for that. Now if I put customer at the center of it, you will have three, uh, let's talk about the policy. You will have something called as the digital enablers or the digital infrastructure that you should need to have. And you should also have uh, the room for giving the innovations the private innovation. So what actually happened in India was uh, a public infrastructure was created with the help of government and the regulator in the terms of creating some kind of an open network platform on which anybody can come in, plug in and play. Uh, so the theme uh, was the public infrastructure, private innovation. Now we cannot have a public infrastructure and public innovation. We cannot really create the kind of private infrastructure and look for a public innovation. So this combination wherein this whole, I can say a highway was created by, by the public, the government and the regulators, and it allowed a lot of private innovations to come in and play. So a lot of fintechs, a lot of private players, a lot of these people come in. Uh, the public infrastructure in the form of creating the digital IDs, in the form of electronic registries, in the form of being able to identify a user uniquely in order to say that, fine, this is the person whom I want to transfer the money to, to put it in a very simple layman's term. And on the other hand, you have a lot of solutions which are coming out of these private players who come in and plug in in this highway and then they provide the different solutions and then the policy enablers. So I think these were all the three pillars based on which uh, this was launched. And over a period of last, I mean, less than a decade, what we see is some kind of a very high exponential growth of the digital payment and the adoption had been quite impressive. Yeah, and I think with everything that's good, unfortunately there's also some bad to come. So one of the topics, we, at least in Europe, discuss a lot at the moment is rising fraud cases with instant payment um, to validate. So how can we be faster in the validation? How can we use data for pattern detection, for example? Something I think that's already very accustomed in the credit card area, a little bit newer to, to payments. Uh, so, Mark, you come also from the industry angle and, and technology. So what do you see really as challenges when looking into some of the threats also in instant payments? I don't necessarily sure I see, see threats. I see a lot of opportunities. And um, similar to, to Sarah and NatWest is at the, has for many years been at the heart of enabling faster payments in the UK. And prior to NatWest, I spent a good chunk of my career scaling up PayPal. Um, and so in, a, in an odd way, kind of sat here today talking about a payments instant and digital. In my world, they've been instant and digital for, you know, for probably 20 years. Um, and clearly on that journey, organizations such as PayPal and, and the traditional banks have spent a lot of time and investment you know, learning how to use the data and detect patterns and understand you know, when a payment is at risk um, and when to put appropriate kind of holds in place and reserves in place and create appropriate pauses in the journey. Now that, that creates frustration for some customers because all of us, once we get a great experience such as UPI in, in India, and I was over there a couple of, couple of months ago and got to see that in action, 
you get to see the general excitement of people saying, look, just how quick this happens. Um, but at certain payment experiences, you need to create some friction. Um, any of us that maybe got an Uber in the last couple of days would be really frustrated if we had to sit in the back of the Uber and wait 10 minutes for the payment to complete. Um, but there's a necessary need for, to, do it, to do that, and certainly in large value transactions, some of the large corporate transactions, you don't want them to go through immediately. You want to have that sense that there is a period of time where people are making the right checks, making sure they're flowing through in the right direction. So I think it very much depends on you know, whether it's a, a retail payment or a commercial mm -hmm. payment, the size of the payment, the need for the payment. Um, and I, you know, I believe that you know, lots of payments are perceived to be instant. <laughs> and, it, and often it's about creating that perception of it as opposed to the reality of it. Thanks a lot. Can I, can I add to that, Mark? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, I would just like to talk a little bit about confirmation of payee in relation to fraud and security, which is really important in terms of how we've taken forward uh, consumers' confidence around faster payments in the UK. So now we're, we're dealing with around a million confirmation of payee requests each day. Uh, this enables the person sending the money to see uh, and, and verify that they're sending it to the person they think they're sending it to. And that's been, you know, the adoption of instant payments will be helped by that extra confidence you've got through that process. Yeah, I think, and those are really the necessary steps that we as an industry need to take. Some will come maybe from regulatory requirements, some from industry initiatives where we jointly agree what are the new standards, so how can we improve that, that journey. Um, we have one question from the audience, which I would actually like to address to Faisal. So, which is the question, do instant payments require instant settlement? So, what is your view on that and also in terms of liquidity management with 24-7? Uh, absolutely, this is a very uh, important area because instant payments needs instant uh, liquidity. Um, today, uh, for example, if I, if I talk about uh, Buna and the way we, we used to manage uh, liquidity, uh, banks from different regions, they can uh, uh, push liquidity into the system either through their local RTGS systems or uh, through their correspondent banks, depending on the currency that they are subscribing in. But as the needs uh, increased to do uh, payments, for example, outside the usual working hours, uh, on weekends, on uh, public holidays, and, and we see that type of payments growing uh, uh, all the time, we introduced a supportive service where uh, banks who are participating can secure liquidity instantly from within the system from other banks in a way complementing what uh, central banks are doing, complementing what correspondent banks uh, are doing. Um, so if, if a bank is a short on a, a liquidity in, in uh, let's say, uh, Saudi Rial, and they would like to pr perform a payment on Friday, which is a public holiday in, 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 in the Saudi market, they can purchase that Saudi Rial from any other bank within the system in exchange for dollar or euro or UAE dirham or any other uh, 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 currency. So we kind of reinforce the position of Buna as a marketplace that uh, is connecting all these banks from different region, not only to perform payments, but also a marketplace for FX and liquidity management, uh, where they can obviously uh, apply their own uh, uh, profit, uh, they apply their own business rules and, and, and so on and so forth. So let's look a little bit deeper into that idea of instantaneous settlement. And as we all know, um, a lot of central banks are at the moment exploring initiatives on CBDCs, wholesale CBDCs with the promise of instant frictionless settlement. So Andrew, I know you're very passionate about this topic. So what is your view on the current status of those initiatives? So I would say that from our perspective, if we think back to the G20 and the work that's been done by the CPMI and by the FSB is to say, how can we reduce the friction, increase the transparency, reduce the cost, and increase the inclusivity of these transactions? And while CBDCs do show a lot of promise and potential, I think they're still in the very nascent phases. So they we're right now in the exploration. Too much attention, I think, is being focused on, you know, too far ahead in the future. We have a lot of problems that we can solve here and today with the people and the organizations represented within this room. It's to say, how can we use some of the newer real-time payment clearing systems? How can we improve RTGS as it exists today through these industry collaborations to start addressing some of those 19 building blocks? Um, 
while CBDCs, again, have a lot of, of promise and potential, they also have some concerns. And a lot of that goes into the socioeconomic factors. If you look at China, Sweden, Nigeria, Russia, some four instances where they have released CBDCs, they're being used in very different respects and to varying degrees. And that's a lot depending on, well, what is that central bank requiring of those users? Is it required that they have full transparency? Or are those users wanting anonymity or uh, obfuscation within those transactions? So we're still looking at the relationship between providers of the CBDCs, those being the central banks, and the users or the recipients of those CBDCs. So again, while there's a lot of research being done in that, I know the Federal Reserve within the US is, is actively working with a project called Project Hamilton in partnership with MIT University. But until we get to that point, I think it's best for us to really focus on the here and now and start addressing those 19 building blocks. And we'll talk about this later, but one of those being CBPR plus is I would rather have some of this human power put towards improving that, adopting ISO 2022 now, while still keeping pace for CBDCs at a point in the future. Mm -hmm. So looking from a government perspective, so Samir, also inclusion is a very important factor. So for example, my mom is 82 years old. To explain her uh, what is a digital euro, why would she need that, can be quite of a challenge. So how do you address that in India when you also look into the adoption of digital payments and also CBDCs? So let me explain it in two parts. Number one, uh, the adoption of UPI in India is already so pervasive that you really need to have a look into how far the retail CBDC is going to work, how far it will be successful. The idea is to have an instantaneous payment and I feel that the UPI has covered a good ground in that respect. However, uh, as far as the inclusion is concerned, the retail CBDC, I mean, we can divide CBDC also into the two parts. We can have retail CBDC, we can have wholesale CBDC. And I feel that, I will agree with Andrew that, you know, as far as the wholesale CBDC is concerned, where we are talking about the cross-border payment, cross payments through the financial institutions, through the banks and all, it may take a lot of more time. It will take some more time for everyone to come together on a common platform. But as far as retail CBDC is concerned, I think, that there is a lot of potential for the retail CBDCs, for P2P transfers, for G2P transfers. Uh, so what we are looking at in India as far as CBDC is concerned currently is trying to find out whether you can really uh, link the currency to the particular benefit that you are transferring. So I'm saying that fine, this is a kind of, you know, the government benefit I'm going to transfer to this set of people. Can I say that or can I block that specific uh, currency for that particular usage? So there, there's a lot of things which are going on there. But I feel uh, uh, in India, if you ask me, uh, uh, the progress of CBDC, because of the all pervasive existence of UPI is going to be a bit slow. But for the cross-border payments, I am sure that the retail CBDC is going to be adopted much faster than the wholesale CBDCs in the coming time. Very interesting. So we're talking about public initiatives, we're talking about regulations. So Mark, when we discussed, you said actually it's the client that should decide and not the government. So how do you see really the driver changing from regulatory requirements and adopting in some payment and CBDC versus private initiatives and what is really the core? Are we being simply too slow to adopt some of these things? I think similar, similar to Andrew at NatWest, we're, we're delighted to be at the heart of those consultations and working closely with the regulators and the central banks to work out how digital ledger technology can be used and to, to best effect. Um, but when we were, like we were talking yesterday, it's about identifying the, the problem. What, what problem are we trying to solve with it? And, and each country around the world is at a different point in its payments evolution. Um, and so there are different problems that need solving. The UK is particularly advanced. I think if you ask most UK consumers, they'd say, yes, we have an instant form of payment. And they say, we don't need anything else. You touched on inclusivity. I think that's really important. Um, for the first time in a while, caching, the use of cash in the UK increased last year. Some of the stats that have just been released. Um, personally at home, I have my mother-in-law living with me. She has early dementia. Cash is really important in our household because it keeps her included in society. 
And despite the research suggests that all of us at some point will become vulnerable at some point. So at the moment, we can all get our multiple phones out and we can work how to use them. There's going to come a point in life when we, ca we can't. Um, and we're going to need to make sure that society is inclusive. Um, and we have to look at what, what is the problem we're trying to solve um, and apply the right technology at the right point in time. Um, good payment experiences typically need a great user experience and they need a flywheel to drive adoption of them. Um, and I think in a number of areas, we're still looking for those flywheels. Um, and there are certainly plenty of people out there who are actively investing in looking for those flywheels, and one of them will pop up. Um, but um, we have to ensure that we use these, these new technologies for the right reasons, not just for the sake of using them. So Sarah, when we discussed, so you said, for example, proving uh, finding the right priority in investments is particularly hard because you have regulatory requirements, you have customer demand, and you have technology really coming up. So how do you solve that magical triangle? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. So you know, the so UK regulatory environment has put a, you know, a very heavy burden, I think, on the banks in terms of regulatory compliance. And when you look at, you know, typically the traditional banks will have you know, extremely complex and legacy architecture. Um, and that is a huge burden in terms of investment. Uh, so, you know, there's all often not much left over for discretionary enhancements that, that benefit the customer experience. So I think it's about finding, you know, when we've got the bonnet up, when we're you know, doing that work to our systems, what else can we do to be able to embed, uh, you know, customer benefits into the payment journey uh, to, to you know, help that adoption and advocacy of the, the instant payment capability. Um, but having said that, you know, I do, I do feel that there are re that there are ways that we can look to drive investment, uh, perhaps in different ways that we've done before. So you're seeing far more traditional banks taking a buy, build, partner approach to you know, any sort of strategic investment now, really, you'd look to see what the most efficient and effective way of creating that partnership, often using API technology to work with the fintech to deliver the, you know, the, the, the customer focus capabilities on the sort of complex architecture stack traditionally sat in banks. And I think that that's more and more interesting in terms of driving forward that proposition without huge sunk investment costs. And the other thing that I would say is that, you know, the regulatory compliance burden is not always a bad thing. I mean, obviously, it's making uh, the world more connected, safer, and secure for our clients. But what it's also doing is, you know, payments is an ecosystem, and it's forcing the participants in that payments ecosystem to come together to innovate. So actually, you know, the sort of government-directed initiatives such as ISO or open banking have actually driven a great pace of innovation because everybody's got the car bonnets up at the same time and uh, you know what can we embed while we're going through that process yeah true we got another question a little bit related to that which is more about the barriers really to adopting some of those initiatives so um i might actually start with faisal giving you a view and then maybe uh going to to andrew to to add to that uh, from our experience uh, I, I think uh, the readiness of the banks uh, talking again from an infrastructure point of view, cross-border point of view, because our our uh, our clients are the, are the banks uh, basically. <coughs> so their readiness to uh, provide the 24 by 7 operation, 24 by 7 uh, compliance screening, because uh, again cross-border payments is a different uh, game. Compliance requirements are are much higher than uh, national flows. Uh, ability to to provide the 24 by 7 FX uh, conversion as well, uh, where applicable, uh, depending on the corridor. Uh, ability to uh, to support ISO 2022 as well, uh, which is still on the on the low side in in, in, in various regions. So from experience, this is um, this is the barriers we have been uh, seeing, working closely with our banks, with SWIFT uh, as well, in order to overcome uh, those. Um, customers are ready, in, in my view. So uh, it, it's really, it's on the banks to, to, to up their infrastructures. Customers are ready, customers are uh, uh, expecting uh, this experience. They are doing it in, in, in the domestic uh, flows, and they expect it in the cross-border space. And I would just add on, when we think about adoption, 
I think adoption is happening, not yet mass adoption, but in small pockets within the world. So what we've seen is we're moving from you know, phase one to two to three within this, this global banking landscape. Phase one is these domestic US system or systems like US real-time payments, FedNow, et cetera. And then going into intra-regional like Buna, where you're supporting those regions or close countries in a specific geography. And then into phase three, which is true inter-regional collaboration. And through efforts like Project Nexus, as well as working with IXB, with the Clearinghouse and EBA Clearing, is we're starting to see some instances of this inter-regional collaboration take place. But again, it's very organic from the grassroots, almost grounds up. We've not yet seen it being pushed from the top down. While there is some direction, and again, this is where the 19 building blocks certainly lend uh, credence to that, We've not yet seen a dramatic drive towards that, but I think we're still just at the beginning of the momentum. If we think about the, the snowball analogy, when it's very small is when it's toughest to get that snowball going. And so I think we're still at the very beginning of this journey, but we have seen a lot of collaboration. The use of ISO 2022 is only helping to further that, et cetera, but it's really to bring it to the main stage. And I think it's events and organizations like this that help show that there is drive, there is demand, and now they're starting to be supply with Buna and with some of their clearing systems. In these harmonious pockets, it will just be a matter of time before each one of those pockets starts to collide with others and we start to unify at a larger and larger scale. So, Mark, from your experience, for example, from PayPal, because we always try to find the consensus on trying to build these bridges and this collaboration, um, are we missing on speed in that? Um, would you say sometimes a more straightforward approach can actually make us faster uh, in delivering client value? I think linking it back to something Sarah said, the, the banks, including NatWest, have continued to invest huge amounts in continuing to evolve our back-end systems. Uh, and we're not going to drive all the innovation ourselves. So by taking an API-first approach, you're able to, and we have been for many, many years, powering a lot of the fintech experiences which are enabling instant cross-border payments. So I think we're probably a bit harsh on ourselves by saying, you know, what are the barriers? I think there are already a, a lot of those barriers have been taken down. Uh, again, in different countries, there are certain different corridors and different experiences that have popped up and different brands that have done a, a really good job of creating very friction-free and relatively low-cost cross-border payment experiences. Um, and we'll continue to, to support that both with our own proprietary experiences, but also by enabling our, our platform to be used by other players as well. So um, I think there's just a lot of possibility that's still, still unexplored. But again, it's about finding the right use cases for it and addressing those friction points. Just as a build on that, Mark, I um, wonder, I mean, do you think that clients in the UK actually demand instant cross-border payments, even using the sort of traditional correspondent network uh, banking arrangements? 98% of our payments are settled within 24 hours. Um, and initiatives such as Swift GPI obviously create a good deal of traceability for clients through the payments process. I'm not sure that I'm seeing ubiquitous demand for instant cross-border from clients as long as they can track and trace and have certainty of charges. I think that, that visibility, that tracking and tracing, things such as Swift GPI, you know, the implementation of ISO 222 to make it all much easier to everyone to you know, not to have to pick up the phone or drop an email to understand where a payment is. There's a definite demand for that. But I'd probably be with you that for you, we don't hear people saying, can you make a payment faster? Mm. But if I take that to the, the consumer or the retail end of the spectrum, you know, from a remittances perspective, there are people that do instantly want to send 10 or 15 pounds or 20 dollars across the world mm. because that's the difference. A colleague I used to work with many years ago that in the remittance businesses, I used to say, what do you do? He said, I do chickens. And I said, chickens, what do you mean? He said, I enable someone to send 10 dollars across, across the world so that their mother can buy chickens. <laughs> and that's food on the table. And I thought that was a really interesting one. They want instant payment and they want it to be quick and simple and they don't want large charges associated with it. Yeah, it's an interesting development. Um, so Samir, in India, um, what are your preferred corridors in terms of cross-border adaptation? Have you prioritized saying um, with, with dollar or uh, any initiatives that are currently ongoing with other central banks? So the central bank in India is actually in touch with some of the other central banks. Uh, 
I will not be able to comment on the prioritization at this stage because we are in too much of an initial stage. And as I've told you, uh, the current focus as of now should be to build on retail cross-border uh, uh, payments which should be made frictionless instantaneous. Just to tell you an example, for example, uh, if I really want to transfer some money to some of my relatives, so to one of my friend who needs money in, in somewhere else, it needs to be instantaneous. I need it to be passed immediately. As Andrew said, he wanted to send it immediately. But when I'm looking at the big transactions, I mean, which have culminated over a period of, let's say, a big tender process after a discussion of 30 days, 45 days, I mean, why do you need 45 seconds for that <laughs> payments to happen? <laughs> My point is, it actually depends upon, you know, the value that you are talking about. So on one hand, we should have the volume that you look at, and that's where this question which you initially asked, how many payments will be instant in five years? So I look it into two parts. If I look at the volume wise, I feel that volume wise, the instant payments will be more than 90% in the next five years. But if you really see value wise, mm. it will still be less than 10% in the next five years. So this question needs to be looked into that perspective. So when we're talking about the cross-border payments, the frictionless instantaneous cross-border payments, we should be very much aware of a lot of regulatory uh, compliances, the requirements, which Faisal has also pointed out, and the actual need to be more secure, the verified authentication. I'm not saying the technology is emerging fast and you might come up with the technology which can help you in instantly identifying and verifying or some kind of a pre-verification process could also be put in place. But we have to be very clear on what exactly we want to achieve uh, when we say that the payments have to be instantaneous. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we have another question related a little bit to that, maybe to get your experience, Sarah. So instant payment cross-border, regulatory compliance, will it be a challenge? I mean, we have fraud, we have AML requirements, all of that needs to happen in that time frame. So what is your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've, we've touched upon many of these points already, which is, you know, we have very different regulatory regimes. We have different operational settlements issues. Um, we have, you know, the, the, the tech and the IT to connect the cross-border rails. We're not there yet in terms of uh, in terms of friction-free cross-border payments, and you know I, I think it was uh, a point was made earlier. We, we we need that sort of top-down central bank coordination and collaboration around the standards that are required to really drive through that. You know. To, to, to create a faster payment system that works cross-border in the way that we have working well domestically. There are lots of barriers to entry, and I think that really needs some coordinated central response to that. And I think it plays into the exact theme of this year's Cypos, really. And that brings us actually to our next uh, slide or question, where we would like to get your view on that as well, which is more on the drivers, how can we enable that journey towards an instant and digital payment world? So once again, I invite you to uh, open the app and join us on our next, uh, on our next poll. Um, and uh, hopefully we get some interesting insight from our, from our audience on that. And while the responses are coming in, if I could just add on to Sarah's comment is, and to add on to what Mark said is, I don't see this as a challenge, but an opportunity. So if we think about cross-border payments and really enabling this instantaneous cross-border, I look at it as three separate levels. So the first level being the most rudimentary is technology, the use of ISO 2022. So it's very easy to perform a black and white comparison to say, do these two matches, our standards match? Where are there differences? What's that delta? How do we solve for it? Second on top of that is the operational layer, is based on the data that's within that message, how then do we operationalize this and ensure that the experience that we provide for both the sender and the receiver is the same and is uniform across these various regions. And then the third is the regulatory legal area, and that's the one that is proven to be the most complex. And so while some may look at it as challenging, others may look at it as an opportunity for us to again, assemble in different coalitions, different work groups to say, we have a unique opportunity here within the banking space to reimagine 
what should this regulatory framework look like on an international level, and let's work together very collaboratively to improve that for now and going forward, maybe taking into account the use of CBDCs and future technologies, but to really hit the reset button right now. So again, regulatory is certainly a big part of that, uh, but and it's you know complex, not uh, to say the least, but offers a lot of opportunity to improve payments for the future. So when we look into the answers, and thanks a lot for everybody on participating, regulation really seems to be on top of everybody's mind on this topic. So Samir, would that really pay into your experience as well? Is the industry really screaming for regulation or are there also other means in boosting the adoption rate? We have to look at it from the point of view of the role of regulators in the financial sector. I mean, to be, to be very honest, the role of regulators in the financial sector is certainly very different from the role of regulators in any other industry. That's mainly because for any other industry, you will have, you know, uh, and the promoter and the debt equity ratio in the terms of around say, 60, 40 or something. But when we are talking about the financial industry, for banks and all that, how much exactly is the money that the promoter puts in and how much does he actually raise from the depositors and how much he actually deploying forward and making out the money. So in order to safeguard the people's interest and all that, I feel, I mean, just to give a background, the role of regulator is really very, very important as far as this industry is concerned. That's it. And to keep the uh, interests and to safeguard the interest of every stakeholder and thing, I think the regulation, the regulators are going to play an important role. But let me tell you, over the last few years, what we've seen is that the regulators are also realizing the need. They are aware of the demand of the industry. They're not, they're not uh, opaque to that. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some kind of a adoption of the regulators. They're being more open to understanding the problems. They're more open to discussions with the industry people. And that's how I think the new things are coming up. The regulations are certainly going to be an important aspect as far as the cross-border digital payments are going to be concerned, it's, it's all about the various regulators coming into uh, play together. It's all about the common play. But I think the most important thing here will be something which we call as a technology. I mean, the interoperability, you know, everywhere, all across the world, if you say in silos, everybody is working. So there you have some region which is working out something. We have in uh, South Asia, where something is being worked out, we have various regions where you have CBDCs being played across. The role of CBDC is also different. The idea of CBDC is different across different geographies, what they are trying to achieve with that. But at the end, what I think is what you require is an interoperable system which can bring all these silos together, the fragmented economies together. It's some kind of a open network on which everybody can come and uh, you know plug in and play and then this interoperability happens. Regulations are certainly going to play an important role and that's where I feel that a lot of standardization is going to happen. So regulation along with the the advent in technology and the interoperability is something which I think is going to drive this. I just just build on that. I, I find the answer to that question quite odd. You know, I don't see regulation as a driver. It's it's one of the many enablers. And I'll come back to what I said earlier. You you could regulate for something, and you can make it completely free as well. If it's a poor experience, it won't get used. Yeah. Um, and so for me, it comes back to what's the user experience, and it's very difficult to harmonise a user experience on a global basis. Um, but there are various organizations that have done it in certain pockets for certain use cases, uh, and they've made very, very big businesses out of it. Uh, I think that's what we need to look for, are the, the use cases and the user experiences. The other stuff then naturally comes together, and the regulator is, is there to ensure that everything is done safely and fairly. Um, and as banks, we have an obligation, and we do spend, we invest a huge amount of time and people and talent in engaging appropriately in those regulator conversations. And I know it's not necessarily pleasant or easy at times, but it's a necessary part of it. You, you have to keep talking, we have to keep demonstrating, we have to keep bringing real life examples to the table so it isn't theoretical, it's actually practical. And we'll, we'll get there, but we are, the, the globe is, is very different uh, and everyone is at different points in their journey. And there are certain corridors where cross-border trade is, is more important than others. And if we focus on those, there'll be obvious use cases and things will follow from that. 
do you sometimes feel that we talk more about clients than with clients in that regard? I think that's definitely the case. You know, I've spent most of my career being very close to the customer because uh, you then really understand what their needs are, where they're coming from, what the challenges are. Then you can start to understand the kind of experiences that will solve those problems. I think that's a really good point and actually I think there's more of a trend now of co-creating with customers than there ever has been before which is you know it is perfect in terms of creating a user experience that actually it's important to, to the end customer. Yeah. Uh, if I may I would have personally maybe picked the pricing and expanded on it to call it the, the uh, overall customer expectations and, uh, and uh, demands. Um, as I said because today customers are used to do instant payments domestically, uh, the expectation also to, to do it at cross-border level. And here the collaboration point becomes very important because uh, uh, systems like Buna, uh, they cannot do it by themselves. We need to collaborate with, uh, with partners, uh, such what, like what we are doing now with, uh, with India, uh, with uh, Egypt, uh, with uh, Pakistan, with Jordan, where we are onboarding their instant payment systems into our multilateral setup and uh, create this uh, hub uh, concept where transactions can flow from one instant payment system to another across borders in a, in a, in a, in a, in a seamless way and have a direct uh, effect on, on things like pricing, uh, speed, uh, transparency, traceability. Um, I think this is, this is uh, a core area and it's in line with what uh, the G20 now is, is uh, pushing for as well in terms of global collaboration. And we have another question coming in, which relates a little bit to that, and I really invite everybody, because it's quite inclusive questions. So, what are the key drivers, circumstances to instant payment adoption? Why is it working well in India or Brazil, but less so in Europe or North America? So, whoever uh, feels, uh, feels happy, happy to I'm happy answer. to start there, because I'm relatively fresh from a, a recent visit to India. Um, um, my apologies if I... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think you know, India comes from a very different place to a lot of other, other countries. Right? Compared to the UK, you, the UK has been on a journey of digital and instant payments and mobile payments for a very long time. And so we have, for example, we had a very advanced card network. You know, we'd adopted chip and pin, then we adopted NFC, so mobile and NFC payments could flow. So if there were customers who were already able to interact with the payment system in a very frictionless way. Whereas I think India was starting from a de very different position. And therefore, it was, it was in a wonderful position of having a blank sheet of paper. So you were able to think about it and say, how do we approach this in the most inclusive operating system agnostic way? And one of the things that really delighted me when I was talking to my colleagues over in India, I said, so what, what level of smartphone do you need to have to be able to use this? And they said there was a very basic standard. And someone used to tell me an example of how, I think it was their, one of the members of, of their house had said, it, one thing I want as part of my package for working with you is a smartphone and they specified of this standard and it was a standard they wanted so they could use UPI which I thought was, was really interesting so you, you'd, you had a blank canvas you didn't have the incumbent technology all that investment that went into it we saw it in Europe when um, you know, certain markets in Europe caught up with uh, with card acceptance technology they, they leapfrogged and went straight to a different set of technology and the investment required in that is significant. Whereas in, in India, you just needed a, a relatively low level smartphone and a printed QR code. And I love the little squawk boxes that sit alongside them as well, they're really cool. And so I'll jump in for the US perspective. So I would say first is existing experiences. And this is where many individuals who use applications like PayPal or Venmo already provided with what they believe is a real-time experience because to them, they see the debits and credits move instantaneously. It's not until they want to actually withdraw those funds at an ATM that they start to incur that friction, but there's oftentimes a disassociation between the two. So now with the use of real-time payments, we're starting to provide that parity of the actual settlement with the experience, but that parity does not yet exist. So one is, again, that existing experience. Two is existing fragmentation, is we as an industry within the US seem to get further and further fragmented and less ubiquity within the US banking space. 
And that then leads into number three, which is simply the bifurcation of the two systems within the US. And to uh, the point that was made earlier about interoperability is right now we're moving really away from that within the US is even though both FedNow and TCHRTP are using ISO 2022 standards, they're using different variants of that. You're not able to have uh, message system transversal, meaning you can't start on one system and then transfer to the other or vice versa like you can with some other systems. And so we, as an industry, to some extent, are, can be our own worst enemy to that. And so it's really through this industry collaboration that we should look to drive these efforts together versus apart. So I'd say those are some of the driving factors of why, at least within North America, within the US, we've seen uh, less adoption and uptick like in UPI, like in Buna, like in uh, P27 and Nexus, et cetera. And there's another question related a little bit to that. And Faisal, I think you would be the best to answer. Um, how can SWIFT and regulators help to drive interoperability to enable adoption of initiatives that support cross-border payments? Uh, so regulators, obviously, uh, they, they are the, in, in many countries, they are the owners or the operators of uh, the domestic payment um, systems. And uh, they're, they're uh, Catalyst role is, is key in uh, making it uh, uh, simple for them to move to the cross-border uh, space because 90% of them are really designed and operating uh, for, for, for domestic payments uh, only. So whether it's about uh, the, the, the legal framework, uh, the, the permissions that are necessary, the accessibility to the, to the payment systems, these things can only happen with the support of uh, the regulators. Uh, even also on, on, a, on a operational aspects like uh, transaction limits, for example, uh, currencies allowed, because most of these uh, uh, domestic payment systems operate maybe with, with one or two currencies maximum. So definitely there is a, a role for regulators there. Uh, from SWIFT uh, point of view, as I, as, as I mentioned, and uh, working uh, closely with them on uh, increasing uh, uh, the, the level of ISO 2022 adoption. Uh, this is a key point uh, for uh, supporting instant payments. Um, so this is uh, probably the, the, the key aspects. There are so many other uh, also. Uh, on, the, on the technical side, um, as I said, banks' readiness to be 24 by 7. This is also an area where uh, uh, SWIFT and also the fintech industry, they can uh, play a role in supporting the banks, upgrading their uh, infrastructures to become 24 by 7 uh, compatible. So, Sarah, you mentioned earlier increasing the limit to instant payment has been a very important factor in adoption. Faisal just confirmed that. Uh, so, what are the lessons learned from that? I mean, I, I think primarily, obviously, the, the, the risk of increasing the payment size is, is around the increased or sort of heightened impact of fraud. And I think in the UK, we've, we've gradually increased the payment limits as we've improved our fraud detection and fraud prevention exercises. Obviously, one of the big risks with an instant payment is once the money is out of the door, it's gone. And, uh, you know, developments like confirmation of payee, the sort of the AI techniques that we're using to put some friction into the payment chain where it's necessary to identify some sort of forward protection activity, making sure that those safeguards keep track with the limit increases is probably the key thing that's needed to give both the, you know, the participant banks and the end client confidence. Excellent. So maybe to take another perspective, I've recently been in, in Africa and my taxi driver in Zimbabwe were discussing payment methods, apps, and whatsoever. And what he says was also interesting. For him, cash equals freedom. So there's less traceability. It's about anonymity. It's less fees from his perspective, or from a bank's perspective sometimes. So Mark, do you think in this new world, uh, we don't need cash anymore? Or how can we balance those views on digital payments and cash? I think, you know, I said earlier, cash is really imp important for an inclusive society. Um, and it's proven to help you know, young people understand the value of money. People are using it increasingly to, to budget. Um, you know, the, what we call in the UK the jam jar economy, where you have a jam jar for different things you need to pay for. It's very visible. Again, various tech players have started to help visualise digital money. Um, so it d does start to overcome some of those things. 
but cash is is instant. It's redeemable. Yeah, I wouldn't you know, support the idea of it being you know, enabling you know, untoward things, but um, it is definitely plays a part in society, um, and I can't see it um, going away. And we at NatWest invest a huge amount in making sure that we can support the cash economy, both from a retail side and a commercial side, in a sustainable way. Because um, I think we, we have a responsibility to do that. Um, I personally would be very disappointed at the idea of a cashless society, but it, it has its has its part to play. You, know, you have to have a whole range of different payment methods because everyone's needs are very diverse. Um, so we have to uh, have to support that. Interesting stat on that, actually. So we had a payments conference quite recently at Lloyd's, and obviously Lloyd's take a very similar stance to NatWest in terms of protecting vulnerable customers and bank customers and making sure that the UK economy is uh, banking economy is, is inclusive. Um, we had a treasurer from a brewery um, who was saying over COVID, the use of cash went down to 6% of total transactions. Post-COVID and in the sort of cost of living pressure environment, it's gone back up to 20%. So ev even though we are seeing the use of cash decline year on year, actually in certain pockets, in certain type of environment, so where you might want to budget by using cash, we're actually seeing cash come back into the, uh, you know, into, into the economy more than we probably have anticipated post-COVID. Very interesting development. And as our session draws to a close today, um, I would actually like uh, every one of you to, to summarize from your perspective what will be the most important driver for, for you personally for us to achieve a future instant and digital payment world. So, and I would like to start with Faisal, please. I, I believe uh, interoperability is, uh, is going to be. Uh, uh, a, a very important milestone in the, in the future of this industry, uh, cross-border instant payments in particular. Uh, from uh, Buna's side, uh, we will be doubling down on this effort, uh, creating this collaboration with, uh, as I mentioned, with countries like India, countries like Egypt, uh, Pakistan, uh, other countries where uh, we are a home of uh, one of the largest remittance markets worldwide, and uh, remittances is the most uh, impacted, I would say, uh, segment today by the frictions of uh, cross-border payments, whether from cost or uh, speed or any other uh, aspect. Um, so uh, achieving interlinking with, with different payment systems to remove these uh, frictions is, is, a, is a very important uh, step. Uh, collaboration with the G20, collaboration with Nexus project, um, domestic payment systems. This is uh, this is key. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. I mean, I, I agree. I, th I think at a macro level, uh, collaboration to reduce the fragmented nature of the, the sort of domestic islands when it comes to payments infrastructure is absolutely key to move the market forward. On a very specific level in the UK, for corporates to adopt instant payments in the way that retail have, it's a cost differential. So you know, it's more expensive to send payments via faster payments than it is by backs. And so we'll, we'll continue to see customers using backs rather than faster payments until that differential narrows. Perfect. Thanks. Samir? Oh, well, I feel that uh, in the coming time, we'll be moving from platform-based applications to the open network-based applications. That's the protocol-based applications. And that's going to really make the payments instantaneous. We'll facilitate the interoperability. A simple example which I keep quoting is something about HTTP. So you can, you can instantaneously mail from your mobile, from any of this thing, to anyone across the world without knowing who created HTTP. You don't know. We don't know who created HTTP. It's a protocol-based solution. So right now, we are all in a platform-based solutions across the world. What I see is coming down five years down the line, we'll have some kind of an open network-based platforms wherein everybody, every platform, every user will be hopping on that. And that's going to provide all the kind of solutions as far as the instantaneous digital payments, either domestically or for the cross border is concerned. Thank you very much. Mark? I think certainly my feeling is the UK has, has got a broad range of already instant and near instant and digital payment experiences. Um, it's aware that and we'll continue to evolve on those. I think the, the ones which will continue to evolve at the fastest rate were the ones that have the best user experiences. Uh, so I always focus on what's, what's the problem we're trying to solve 
uh, and what's the user experience that goes with it. Excellent, thank you. Andrew? And I would sum it up in one word, which is proactivity. Let's be proactive with the development that's needed to comply with some of these standards like CBPR Plus and ISO 2022. To be proactive when it comes to industry collaboration, working within industry work groups and coalitions. And then to, again, be proactive in terms of education, educating yourself, your colleagues, your leadership, et cetera, on the benefits and why there is this business case to put forward to adopt and to migrate into this new way of uh, instant and digital payment. So again, proactivity would be my, my key call to action. Great, and for me, as also the conversation that we're gonna have. So thanks a lot for joining the session today. It was a pleasure uh, with you all kicking us off to Cybos uh, for exciting days with lots of discussion. I think we'll have some good food for thoughts uh, for the next days. So thanks a lot and uh, looking forward to meeting you at Cybos. Thank you.